live from San Diego, California, it's theCUBE. Covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back. This is theCUBE's fourth year of coverage at KubeCon Cloud Native Con. We're here in San Diego, it's 2019. I'm Stu Miniman. My host for this afternoon is Justin Warren, and happy to welcome two guests from the newly minted Platinum member of the CNCF NetApp. Uh, sitting to my right is Matt Baldwin, who is the director of Cloud Native and Kubernetes Engineering, and sitting to his right is Rob Esker, who's the product and does product and strategy for Kubernetes, and is also a NetApp board member on the CNCF. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, uh, so, uh, you know, Matt, maybe, maybe start with you. Uh, you, you know, NetApp, uh, you know, companies that know, I've got plenty of history uh, with NetApp there. Uh, what I've been hearing from NetApp for the last few years is, you know, the core of NetApp has always been software, and it is a multi-cloud world. Um, I, I've been hearing this message since before kind of the cloud native and Kubernetes piece was yeah. going. Uh, of course, there's been some acquisitions and NetApp continuing to go through its transformations, if you will. Uh, so, uh, help us understand kind of NetApp's uh, positioning in, in this ecosystem. In Kubernetes? Yes. Yeah, okay, so what we're doing is uh, we're, we're building a product that allows you to manage cloud-native workloads on top of Kubernetes. So we've solved the infrastructure problem, and that's kind of the old problem. We're bored to death talking about that problem. Um, but we, what we try to do is we try to provide a single pane of glass to manage on-premise workloads and off-premise workloads. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to say it's now more about the app taxonomy in Kubernetes and then what type of tooling do you build to manage that, that application in Kubernetes? And so that's what we're building right now. And that's where we're headed with the hybrid uh, multi-cloud. I mean, there, there, there's a piece of it though that does draw from you know, the historical strengths of NetApp, of yeah. course. Uh, so we're building, uh, we have essentially already in, in market a capability that allows you to deploy Kubernetes uh, in an agnostic way using pure, open, unmodified Kubernetes on all of the major public clouds, but also on-prem. Mm -hmm. uh, but over time, and some of this is already evident, you'll see it married to the storage and data management capabilities that we draw from the historical NetApp and that we're starting to deploy into those public clouds. With the idea that you should be able to take a project, so a project being a namespace, namespace having a certain, uh, an application in it, so you have multiple deployments, that I should be able to protect that namespace or that project, I should be able to move that, and the data goes with it, so that we're very data aware. And that's what we're trying to do with, the, with our, so our software is, you know, make it very data aware and have that aligned with apps inside of Kubernetes. Yeah, so Rob, maybe step back for a second. One of the, one of the things we've heard a few times at this show before, and it was talked about the keynote this morning, is it is project over company when it comes to the CNCF. Project. Project over company. So right. it, it, it's about the ecosystem. The CNCF tries not to be opinionated, so it's okay for multiple projects to fit in a space. Uh, NetApp moving up to a platinum uh, uh, sponsor level, um, uh, you know, participant here. You know, NetApp's got lots of histories in participating and driving standards, helping move where the industry is going. Where does NetApp see its position in, uh, you know, the 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 the, the participating in the foundation and uh, participating in this ecosystem? Yeah, so great question, and actually I love it. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics. So. Um, I think the way we look at it is, oftentimes projects, to the extent they become ubiquitous, define a standard, a de facto standard. Yeah. So not necessarily ratified by some standards body. And, and so we're very interested in making sure that in the scenario where you would employ the standard, from a technology integration perspective, our capabilities can, can operate as an implementation behind the standard. Uh, you know, so you get the distinguishing qualities of our capabilities, our products and our services, vis-a-vis, -vis, or in the context of the standard, but we're not trying to take you down a walled garden path in a proprietary uh, 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 journey, if you will. Uh, we would rather actually compel you to work with us on the basis of the, the value, not necessarily operating off a, a proprietary set of interfaces. Uh, so Kubernetes, you know, broadly perceive it as uh, a de facto standard at this point. There's still some work to be done on running out the edges. Uh, a lot of it underway this week. Uh, it's definitely the case that there's uh, an appeal to making this more operable by, pardon the expression, mere mortals. Uh, and we think we can offer some, some, some help in that yeah. respect as well. Yeah, for us it's uh, usability. Right, I mean, that's the reason I started Stackpoint Cloud. 
was that there was a usability problem with Kubernetes. I had a usability problem with Kubernetes. And so that's what we're trying to, that's how I'm looking at the landscape. And I look at kind of all the projects inside of the CNCF and I look at my role is, our role is to, how do we tie these together? How do we make these so they're very, very usable to the users? Um, and how we're engaging with the community is to try to like align like this basically peer upstream projects and create a usability layer on top of that. Yeah. But we're not going to, we don't want to ever say we're going to fork any of these projects, but we're going to contribute back into these projects. Yeah. So that's, that's one concern that I have heard from some customers, we were speaking with some of them yesterday. Uh, one of the concerns they had was that when you add that manageability onto the, the base Kubernetes layer, yeah. that often uh, various vendors become rather opinionated about which way we think this is a good way to do that. And right. when you're trying to maintain that compatibility across the ecosystem, so some customers say, well, I don't actually don't want to have to be too closely welded to any one vendor, because part of the benefit of Kubernetes is I can move my workloads around. So right, how do what, you navigate what, what, what is the right level of, of opinion to have, and which part should actually just be part of a common standard? Opinion should be along the lines of uh, best practices, is how we do it. So like, let's take uh, network policy, for example. Like applying a, a sane default network policy to every namespace. Uh, defining a sane uh, default pod security policy. You know, uh, building a cluster in a best practices fashion with security turned on, hardening done, where you would have done this already as a user. So we're not locking you in in any way there. I um, mean, so that's, we're not trying, I'm not trying to create any type of opinion in the product. What we're trying to do is harmonize your experience across all this ecosystem. Okay. So that you don't ever have to think about, I'm now, I'm building a cluster on top of Amazon, so I got to worry about how do I manage this on Amazon. Yeah. I don't want you to have to think about those providers anymore, right? And then on top of those, on top of that infrastructure, I want to have a way that you're thinking about managing the applications on those environments in the exact same way. So I'm scaling or I'm protecting an application on premise in the identical way I'm doing it in the cloud. So if it's the same everywhere, what's the value that you're providing that means that I should choose your option than, than something else? So we do have, this is where we have controllers that live inside of the clusters that manage this stuff for the users. Right. So you could rebuild what we're doing, but you would have to roll it all by hand. Yeah. But you could, you know, we don't stand in the way of your operations either. So like if we go down, you don't go down, type idea. But we do have controllers, we have, we're using CRDs, and so like our app management technology, is, our controllers are just watching for workload to come into the environment. And then we show that in the interface. But you can just walk away as well if you wanted to. Cool. There's, also, there's also a, a constellation of other services that we're building around yeah. mm. this e experience. You know, that do draw again from some of those storage and data management capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stateful sets. You know, your traditional workloads that that mm -hmm. want to interact with or transact data against a block or a, mm -hmm. a, a shared file system. Uh, we're providing capabilities for sophisticated qualities of persistence that can be can exist in all of those same public clouds, but Moreover, over time, we're going to be, and, and on-premise as well, we're going to be able to actually move, migrate, place, cache, per policy, your, your persistent data with your workloads as you move, yeah. migrate, scale, burst, what, repatriate, whatever the model is as you move across and between clouds. Okay. How, how far down that pathway do you think we are? Because one, one criticism of Kubernetes is that a lot of the tooling that we're used to from more traditional ways of operating this kind of infrastructure isn't really there yet. Hence, hence the question about, we actually need to make this easier to use. How, how far down that pathway are we? Well, I'd argue that the tooling that I've built has already solved some of those problems. So I think we're pretty far down the, I think we're pretty far down the path. Now, what we haven't done is open sourced you know, all my tooling. Right, to make it easier on everybody else. Yeah. All right, uh, Rob, uh, NetApp's got strong partnerships across the cloud platforms. Uh, I, I, I had a chance to interview George at the uh, uh, Google Cloud event. Uh, I know you partner of the year, I believe, uh, on some of these stuff. Hel help us understand how you know, some of the things Matt and the team are building interact with the public clouds. You know, you, you look at Anthos and Azure Arc, and uh, yeah. of course, uh, Amazon has many different ways you can uh, do your container and, and management piece there. Uh, you know, to talk a little bit about that relationship and how uh, both with those partners and then across those partners, uh, you know, work. Yeah, it's, a, wow, so how much time do we have? So, <laughs> so um, there's certainly a lot of facets to, to that, but drawing from the, the Google experience, we just announced uh, the general availability of cloud volumes on tap, so the ability to stand up and manage your own on tap 
instance in Google's cloud. Likewise, we've uh, announced the general availability of the cloud volume service, which gives you the managed push button as a service experience of shared file system on demand at Google, I believe it was either today or yesterday, at, in London. I guess maybe I'll blame that on the, on the time zone conversion, not knowing what, what day it was. But the point is, is that's now generally available. Uh, some of those capabilities are going to be able to be connected to our ability from NKS to deploy uh, a uh, on-demand Kubernetes cluster and deploy applications from a market marketplace experience in a common way, not just with Google, but with Azure, with Amazon. And so, you know, frankly, the story does differ a little bit from one cloud to the next, but the, the endeavor is to provide common capabilities across all of them. It's also the case that we do have people that are you know, very opinionated about I want to live only in the Google or the Microsoft or the Amazon ecosystem. We're trying to deliver a rich experience for those folks as well, even if you don't value the agnostic multi-cloud experience. Yeah, and Matt, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a viewpoint on this, but you know, it's that skill set that that's really challenging. You know, I was at the Microsoft show, and you've got people. You know, it's not just about .NET. There's all the they're they're embracing and open to all of these environments, but people tend to have the environments that they're used to and for multi-cloud to be a reality, it needs to be a little bit easier for me to go uh, mm -hmm. b between them, but it's, it's still, uh, we're, we're still, we're, we're making progress, but there, there's, there's work to do. Yeah. What's the question? Yeah, <laughs> so, so I just, you know, you know I, I know you're building tools and everything, yeah. but what, what more do we need to do? What, uh, where are some of the areas that, that you know, you're hopeful for, but what are the areas so for that we a, need to go further? So for me, it's down, like, it's coming down to the data side. Um, like, I need to be able to say that, um, when I turn on data services inside of Kubernetes, uh, I need to be able to have that workload go anywhere, right? And because uh, as a developer, so I have, I'm running in production, I'm running in Amazon, but maybe I'm doing tests locally on my bare metal environments, right? I need, I want to be able to maybe sync down some of my data that I'm working with in production down to my test environment. That stuff's missing. There's no one doing that right now, um, and that's where we're headed. Is that's the path. That's the where we're headed. Yeah, um, I, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because one of the things that I feel like I heard a little bit last year, but it is highlighted more uh, this year, is we're, we're talking a little bit more to the application, to the application developers, yeah. because you know, Kubernetes is a piece of the infrastructure, but it's about it's those, the kernel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's the kernel there. So, yeah. uh, you know, how do we make sure? You know, we're spanning between what the app developer needs and still making sure that you know infrastructure is taken care of because you know storage and networking are still hard. It is. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm I'm approaching. I'm thinking more along the lines of. You know, I'm trying to think more about app developers personally than infrastructure at this point. Um, you know, for me, you know, like, so I have I can give you a cluster in three minutes, right? So I don't really have to worry about that problem. You know, uh, we also put Istio on top of the clusters, so it's like. We're trying to create this whole you know, narrative that you can manage that environment on day one, day two type of operations. But, and that's for like an IT manager, right? And so inside of our product, how I'm addressing this is you have personas, and so you have this concept, you have an IT manager, they can do these things, they can set limits, but for the developer who's building the applications or the services and pushing those up into the environment, they need to have a sense of freedom, right? And so, and on that side of the house, you know, I'm trying not to break them out of their tooling. So, like, we, uh, part of our product ties into Git. Uh, so we have CD, you know, so you just do a Git push, Git commit to a branch, and we can target multiple clusters, right? But at no point did the developer actually draft YAML or anything. We make we we basically create the container for you, create the deployment, bring it online. And I feel like there's these lines, and that, uh, the IT guys need to be able to say, I need to create the guardrails for the devs but I don't want to make it seem like I'm creating guardrails for the devs, because the devs don't like that. So that's how I'm balancing it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, yeah, because that, that has always been the tension and that, that there's a lot of talk about DevOps, but you go and talk to application developers and they don't want to have anything to do with infrastructure, they just want to program to an API and get things done. They would like this infrastructure to be seamless. Right. Yeah, and what we do, like, also what I'm giving them is uh, like service dashboards, because as a developer, you, you, you know, because now you're in charge of your QA, you're writing your tests. Yep. You're pushing it through CI. Yep. It's going to CD. You own your service in production, yep. right? And so we're delivering dashboards as well for uh, services that the developers are running so they can dig in and say, oh, here's an issue, or here's where the issue is probably going to be at, I'm going to go fix this. 
Um, yeah. And we're trying to create that type of like scenario for, for, for a developer and for an IT manager. So a slightly different angle on it, if I'm understanding the question correctly, yeah. is you know, part, part of the, the, the complexity of infrastructure is something we're also trying to provide a deterministic sort of easy button capability for. So you know, perhaps you're, you're familiar with that's Nissan HCI product, which we, we kind of expand that as hybrid cloud infrastructure. If the intention is to make it a, a simple private cloud capability, and indeed, our NetApp Kubernetes service operates directly off of it. It's a big part of actually how we deliver cloud services from it. So the point is, is that if you're that application developer, if you want the effect of NKS on-prem, uh, the endeavor with our NetApp ATI product is to give you that sort of easy button experience because you didn't really want to be a storage admin or a network admin. Or, you, yes. know, you didn't want to get into the, the be mired in the details of infra. Yeah. So, so you know, that's obviously work in progress, but we think we're we're definitely headed down the right direction. Yeah, it does on prem. Yeah, it does seem that a lot of enterprises want to have the cloud like experience, but they want to be able to bring it home. That's we're seeing that right. a lot more. Yeah. So this is like this turnkey on premise, turnkey cloud on premise, yeah. and like with NKS, we can like the same auto scaling. So take so take the dynamic nature of Kubernetes, right? So I have a base cluster size of say four worker nodes, right? But my workload is going to maybe, I maybe need to have more nodes, so my autoscaler is going to increase the size of my cluster and decrease the size, right? Pretty much everybody only can do that in the public cloud. Yeah. I can do that in public cloud and on premise now. Yeah. And so that's that's what we're trying to deliver, and that's you know, yeah, very and that, cool stuff. I think. That, well, there's a lot of advantages to enterprises operating in that way because yeah. I I have I have people out here. I can yeah. I can go and buy them. I can I hire them and yeah. say, hey, we, we need you to operate this gear, and you're, you've already done it elsewhere, you can do it in cloud, you can do it on site. Yeah. I can now run my operations the same across, no matter where my applications live, yeah. which yeah. saves me a lot of money on training costs, on, on development costs, and, and generally it makes for a much more smooth and seamless experience. Yeah. So, Rob, if you could, just uh, love, love your takeaway on, you know, how, kind of NetApp's participation here at the event and what you want people to take away uh, from, from, from the show this year. Um, so it's certainly the case that uh, we're doing a lot of great work. We'd like people to become aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. NetApp, of course, is not, uh, I think we talked about this in perhaps other contexts, not strictly a storage and data management company only. We do draw from the strengths of that as we're providing full stack capabilities in a way that are interconnected with public cloud things like our NetApp Kubernetes services, really the foundational glue in many ways to how we deliver the application runtime, but over time we'll build a constellation of data-centric capabilities around that as well. Yeah, uh, Matt, I would I just love to get your viewpoint as someone that you know built a company mm -hmm. uh, in this ecosystem. There's so many startups here. Uh, g g give us kind of that 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 founder viewpoint of being in of this so, sort of ecosystem. Of the ecosystem? Yeah. Uh, so this is, so I came into the ecosystem at the beginning. Um, I would have to say that it does feel different uh, at this point. Um, I'm going to speak as Matt, not as NetApp. Um, and so my my thinking has always been: it feels a lot like uh, kind of you, you're really you're a big fan of that rock band, right? And you go to the local club, and we all get to know each other at that local club. And there's like maybe 500 of us or a thousand of us, and then that band gets signed to Warner Brothers and goes to the top and now there's 20,000 people on, or 12,000 people. That's how it feels to me right now. Um, I think but what I like about it is that it just shows that the, the power of the community is now at a point where it's drawing in like cities now, not just a small collection of a tribe of people, right? And I think that's a very powerful thing with this community. And um, like all the, what are they called? The Kubernetes summits that they're doing? I mean, we didn't have any of those back when we first got going. I mean, it was, it was tough to fill the room. Yeah. You know, and now now we can fill the room, and, and it's amazing. And what I like seeing is is people moving past the problem of Kubernetes itself, and moving into like what other problems can I solve on top of Kubernetes? Yeah. You know, so you're starting to see all these really exciting startups doing really neat things. Yeah. You know, and I, I really like it. Like this vendor hall, I really like. You know, because you get to see all the new guys. Um, but there's a lot of neat stuff going on, and I'm I'm excited to see where the community goes in the next five years. Um, but it's We've gone from zero to 60, like insanely fast. Because you guys were at the original KubeCon, I think, 
as well. Yeah, it's, our, it's our fourth year doing the, 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 yeah. the Cube at this show, but absolutely, we've watched since the early days. Uh, you know, I'm not supposed to mention OpenStack at this show, but we remember talking to you know, yeah. JJ and yeah. so, so some of the early people Pat, uh, there, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, you know, we, 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 we had interviewed Craig McLucky yeah. back in his Google days yeah, and the great. like, so yeah, um, yeah we, we've been fortunate to be uh, on here for, yeah. uh, for, since uh, really day zero here, yeah. and uh, definitely great energy, so much. Congrats so much uh, on the progress. Uh, really appreciate the updates Thank on you. everything going. And as you said, right, we're, you know, we've, we've reached a certain state and uh, just adding more value on top of this whole environment. Yeah, we're now like, we're in, we're in like junior high now, <laughs> right? And we, we're in grade school for a few years. Uh, all right. Well. Matt and Rob, thank you so much for the update. Uh, ho hopefully not an awkward dance tonight uh, for, for, for the junior uh, uh, <laughs> no. people. For uh, Justin Warren, I'm Stu Miniman, back with more coverage here from KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2019 in San Diego. Thank you for watching theCUBE.